Hi. There is currently a campaign going on to dismantle the white supremacist state in the U.S. The people who are currently under pressure to change a system of violence that kills thousands of black and brown people every year are happy with things the way they are. They will tell you the solution to your problem is a new law or policy, or as they call it, reform. Most of the public don't realize the system as a whole is the problem, and it's impossible to reform. Don't believe me? Then keep watching. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. In these times, it's easy to draw parallels with the 1960s. Black and indigenous people fought for their freedom against the system back then, too. And in many people's eyes, the culmination of their resistance, the prize they were rewarded for all the blood that the state took from them, was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that's one of those things the history books will point to. You know, the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, when black people were finally made equal. Well, they're still not equal. In fact, I'd love to know what you think has even changed since then. Maybe it's because the U.S. is so racist that they'll never be treated equally regardless of what the laws say. Maybe it's because people with power can work around laws if they really want to. After all, someone's supposed to enforce those laws. What if they don't? Or maybe it's because only the laws meant to empower the state are actually taken seriously. Hey, how many voting rights acts are there in the U.S.? How many civil rights acts have there been? It's more than one. It's a lot. Why are there so many? Which one is supposed to have been the definitive one, if all the others seemed necessary? Which is the one that grants those rights we keep getting told that we have? Because I, again, I. I keep getting told that the Constitution itself grants rights. But if that were true, why would all these reforms be necessary? If the Constitution doesn't do anything, what was the point of the 14th, 15th, and 24th Amendments? To look good? To keep black people quiet? Or sometimes they pretend they're making more direct changes with something called police reform. Hmm, sounds promising. Do you know how many reforms the police have gone through in their history? I'm pretty sure you don't, at least not if you're one of those liberals that think they're helping by calling for police reform. Let's take a look just quickly at the Wikipedia page on police reform in the U.S. because I find it pretty telling. You can see at the top, uh, just, just the first line I think is telling in itself. The history of law enforcement in the United States includes many efforts at police reform. They try. Uh, I think the first two articles are, are again, pretty telling. It says, uh, early efforts at police reform often involved external commissions, such as the Wickersham Commission, that spelled out reforms but left implementation to the police. So they were expecting the police to limit their own power voluntarily, willingly? Well, interesting. Good try, anyway. <laughs> Maybe they weren't actually expecting it, of course. <clears throat> you can look here at the next paragraph. In the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson created the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. This huge commission with this comprehensive report and all these reforms it's going to do, and... Are things better now because of that? 
Does anyone even remember it? Did it make any difference at all? <laughs> then it says, uh, the next paragraph, a series of U.S. Supreme Court decisions led to important changes in policing. Oh, did it? Really? So let's look at the two examples that it gives. Map versus Ohio found that evidence obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures may not be used in criminal prosecutions. So, in other words, they needed a law to get people to follow and uphold the law. Then there's the next one. In Miranda v. Arizona, required uh, that criminal suspects must be informed of their right to consult with an attorney. That's their Fifth Amendment right. Or it would be, except this law kind of proved that they don't have that right. What are we supposed to think? <laughs> they needed courts to decide that the law of the land was the law of the land. That's how weak any laws and reforms you believe in are. Most of them are purely cosmetic, and the ones that might do something useful would be unnecessary if the system were actually responsive to the public like it claims to be. So we could spend hours, years really, poring over civil rights legislation and police reforms, but the words don't really matter because people with power aren't bound by words. I have different questions for them. Which of these reforms have made the police accountable to the people? Which of them have stopped police from attacking protesters and other peaceful people? Which have prevented KKK and other fascists from joining the police? Which have made them stop arresting, gassing, or gunning down harmless civilians? None of them? So they're worthless. Legislation is a great way to pacify oppressed people and provide legitimacy for the state. See, they say, the state is doing something. I knew we could work through the system and solve the problem. It's just naive, a fantasy that the people in power will somehow give up some of their power because the law says they have to. You can't use the state to limit the state. The whole point of the state is for the people who control it to have ever more power. They don't accept your limits. They pass whatever laws to give themselves the legitimacy to do whatever they want. Because people think, if it's legal, it's okay. It's fine to gas all those people and throw them in cages, because it's the police and the court system. So it's official. And to someone who doesn't question the supremacy of the state over the people, that makes it okay. Laws and reforms do not limit the state. They just legitimize everything in the eyes of the public. I don't know of any historical incidents when people have legislated their way to freedom. But I do know of many times where the people in power have dangled a law in front of demonstrators to stop them, just like they dangled Bernie Sanders in front of us. It's what Martin Luther King Jr. called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Like, you could theoretically legislate all kinds of things that would make the state less dangerous. You could abolish whole departments and reduce the budgets for war and police and jails. But no one's going to do that. You'd be asking the people with power to give up some of their power voluntarily. They're not irrational. And I'm not talking about politicians, by the way. The politician's job is to look like the centers of power that the news and your old civics class told you they were. I'm talking about the rich and influential people who own the politicians. 
but the news doesn't cover them. So we don't pay attention to them. So we don't know what's really going on. So let the politicians pass whatever laws they like. Nothing will get better for people who aren't rich. You can see it on TV if you're actually looking. Things are no better. The economy is still a rigged competition for survival. Two unresponsive capitalist parties dominate all the elections. Prisons are still full. Wars are still raging overseas. White people are still killing black, brown, and indigenous people of color with impunity. Maybe it's something that the myth of progress can't explain. Maybe, this, maybe progress isn't inevitable. Maybe it's something you have to fight for. Either way, change will never come from a system that exists to maintain the status quo. Telling people they need to stay peaceful while the system continues to kill them is callous and ignorant. There's no peaceful solution to their problems. We need to end this system and replace it with protecting and caring for and cooperating with each other. Thank you.